I can hear you. The lull theory and so forth. Sorry. Yes. Um, and I'm interested in, I'm, I'm teaching a social media class um, here at Berkeley, and I'm real curious about um, the, your, your, your analysis of language being used and it being incorporated into other aspects of our life. You thought you really kind of focused on, on your, your news groups and that kind of thing, but just in, in conversation, have you looked yeah. at that and so forth? Because I think that that's sort of an important kind of trend. I do think, I, I would agree that it's an important trend. Um, and I really, in the longer version of this, I think there's a certain mastery in kind of, I mean, the, the law stuff really deflates the theory, right? I mean, it makes it kind of really specific and goofy. And there's a certain mastery in being able to sort of put things in terms that kind of tweak it a little bit. And I think you interestingly see a lot of this sort of law speak or um, arising kind of internet languages coming out of things like misspellings. I mean, the one I really like is uh, in gaming, there's the term to pwn somebody, right? Yeah, See, I, <laughs> yeah. I work on the important stuff, um, <laughs> which means uh, basically to really uh, effectively defeat an opponent. But it comes from a misspelling of I owned him originally. So it starts off as being explicitly about mastery, and it becomes this jokey term that then gets used in other contexts, too. And I think there's a very sort of uh, lack of boundaries in the way these terms circulate. We have a problem, just a follow-up. I had a student who, um, who had a, a, a MySpace page, and he said, should I be changing anything on that? And I said, right. you need to think about language, and you need to think about pictures, mm -hmm. because it's where it's starting to look. So I said, do you have anything in particular? And he says, well, you know, blah, 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 420. And I said, oh, and I just smiled. And he looked at me and he said, do you know what, even what that is? Right. And I'm going, yeah, pretty much, OK? Right. And all the other students are just really smiling. I'm going, he's thinking that because of my age, I don't understand these things. And so I'm. Right, that you're somehow not able to read that. That, that it, marijuana. yeah, it. <laughs> Becomes, that, that it becomes exclusionary, but I think that's actually, I mean, that's the, the other side of it, right? The openness of forums and the ubiquity of Google and Wikipedia is that we all can decode these things pretty quickly. So um, I often think there's an interesting thing with Facebook kind of becoming multi-generational is that suddenly, you know, like, oh, God, my mom wants to friend me. You know, people have this, the students will have an anxiety over that, and I tell them the same thing I say about anything you do online, which is that it is all public. There's the, the idea that it's not is a fantasy. So act as you're in public. And I think that's, yeah. But it's interesting, because even in student papers, you see that kind of language seep in. Yeah. Another question. Right here. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to particularly put anybody like on the spot, but I would like to say that I think that this is a really smartly uh, composed uh, panel, particularly in terms of how it uh, captures a, a spectrum of, uh, of thought. Um, to that end, if I can, I'd be a little curious to hear what Professor Dreyfus uh, feels about some of the subsequent uh, speakers. I mean, clearly you've informed the overarching themes of this entire presentation by way of the way that you framed uh, Habermans and otherwise. As you're listening to some of the uh, doctoral students and professors who have followed you talking about LOL cats and, and, and shorthand language, are there some thoughts that came to your mind as you were hearing the next generation of thought leaders roll out what's significant to them? Well, I'm afraid that I, I don't have anything have very interesting to say. It's, that wasn't about the public sphere. And I, that's what I was uh, supposed to be knowing about and invited to talk about. I have no views about it, except I kept thinking, how does that relate to the public sphere? And I couldn't figure that out at all. So I have nothing to say, unless somebody else can tell me. Well, I could Forums. Uh, what's a, what, maybe what our panelists it? can just maybe briefly say, uh, in a couple sentences, how, how the topics relate to the public sphere. Or, or, or the forum, which is, after right. all, what this okay. is about. Or the forum. Right. Well, I think all of my material actually comes from forums directly. So that's one way. But also, Wait, say a word about that. What does that mean? I don't even. I mean that I'm mining what people have posted in different forums and commented on and using and using those as examples. But I think the real trick about applying Habermas to the internet is the the shift from the salon culture to an open culture 
it's not the same structure, right? But that's what we're disagreeing about. I think it's exactly the really? same structure. Yeah. A totally disinterested, no risk, uh, no skill, anybody can do it culture. But at some point, when one becomes sort of a tipping point thing, like when one becomes invested in that online public life you lead, there eventually does seem to be, there can be a risk to the investment you've made in the virtual. It's still not a risk in the way you're talking politically. Um, it's not a risk in, in a physical sense, but um, it's sort of a reputation system, right? That that's what you're risking when you speak online or participate in a forum. If you don't care about it, if you have some throwaway account, then whatever. But if you, you are representing as yourself, then you, you're, you have something. It's, it, it's not tangible in the same way. That's but. right, but that's what I was going to say, just to put it my way. I mean, I was thinking about risks in the real world where you right. do something. Right. And th that's what I don't think happens. But you're right, there's a kind of meta risk where, yeah. where your, your image is up there and can be tarnished or polished and so mm -hmm. forth. That, yeah. That's right, and it's just a totally different It's a different, ballgame. yeah. So maybe just we'll, each of the speakers will say a sentence or two, and then we'll address your question. I think a great example of what you're arguing is the comment section on most newspaper sites mm -hmm. on articles, where at least in the Bay Area, it's really reactionary. People don't know what they're talking about. There's been a lot of racist language, and that's, that's an issue that I, I, I would agree with. But I think... <laughs> That's not everything that's going online, and why I argue that a lot of these message boards and discussion forums are becoming a form of this public sphere is, for example, a discussion forum that I'm on is um, this Burning Man Moms Mothers <laughs> um, group, and we talk about parenting in a certain way, and um, and we also talk about you know issues, political issues that are relevant. Um, you know, laws around parenting and motherhood and breastfeeding, et cetera, that I think create this dialogue and we send each other links to articles about this type of activity. So I, I think there's, there are different ways that um, your argument can be applied. Okay. Uh, this is important and interesting to me. And is that an answer to this question about my worry that uh, people with no qualifications and no knowledge and no experience can come into these, these groups equally. There's, there's, how do you get rid of the people who just like to hear themselves you talk don't. about parenting and so forth? Uh, or do you? I mean, I think it depends on, on the form. I think that's one thing people were talking about right. this morning with you know the whole concept of governmentality online and what that means. And I think, again, it's uneven. I think there's a very uneven development. I mean, I... I the, the organization, I mean, the, the, what interests me about the blend between um, Move On and Brave New Films is that, so say, um, you have this mix between experts and everyday individuals. Um, and so, you know, a lot of Greenwald's work is producing these very professional, highly polished films. He's a professional filmmaker, and he goes out and finds the experts to interview for his films, and then those are juxtaposed with, you know, personal on the street interviews and et cetera. But the th where the organization is sort of moving seems to be, to me, in two directions. One is, you know, uh, I can participate because I have experiences of, say, healthcare reform, of being denied, you know, care or something like that, right? And I can contribute my material and my experience to that, right? And then uh, that gets shaped by professionals into something else, or, you know, there's some sort of feedback loop going on there. The other, the other way that it seems to be going, though, is to, you know, into the Kierkegaardian direction where it becomes this echo chamber, it becomes the 30-second spot of, I mean, you know, part of his website uh, lists the, his organization's ability to produce these quick strike commercials that, you know, can, in 24 hours, they can turn around, you know, sort of a hit piece on an issue, right? Um, and I think that's, you know, that may be one response to how political communication happens in our time, but I don't think that that's necessarily the most encouraging or the best, you know. So it's um, not the public sphere. That's not yeah. people discussing things to reach some and that, agreement that's my, or conclusion. Yeah. Right. That's my point is that, uh, you know, ideally social networks and the media they produce, either documentary films or petitions or Twitter feeds or whatever else, there's, there's simultaneously a feedback loop between what happens online and in the real world. 
And that's sort of what I pointed to. Like, we, we communicate via pictures, right? Uh, but then it's also, it's meant to encourage thought. You know, you can't just sort of show up, you know, drop your opinion on something and then, you know. But there has to be that investment, you know. Um, Mark Davis, I'm the Chief Scientist of Invention Arts. I'll be talking the afternoon, but I just have to ask this question about the question of risk-free. Because I, I think that the model of the internet that you're assuming is actually no longer the case. So, and I think in three, three, really, three crucial ways. One, we've moved from a, a realm of material production to symbolic production and the valuation of that, though I'm sure um, there'll be critiques of that. Uh, the, the second is really the no one knows you're a dog on the internet, internet to the internet of real people and real relationships. That's really transformed the last few years. And then the third, and this from a phenomenological point of view, is the internet that is intimately connected to the lived world through mobile. The fact that your real identity in real places in real times, the internet is not some other place that you go to to play anonymously anymore. It's something that's connected to your daily life and the rituals and habits of daily life. So this notion of a risk-free space of, of, of play without expertise that doesn't impact one's career, identity, physical safety, I think is an older notion of the internet that's rapidly fading. And so that, that's the critique and question that I would have of the notion of risk-free. So First, I mean, so in other words, the, the Habermas belief in the value of the public sphere is something that's just irrelevant now. Something else is going on because what he was talking about was that people would get together and on, by, by rational discussion, disinterested discussion, desituated and so forth, they would reach conclusions which would influence the people who actually made decisions. That's over, if, you're, if I understand you right. Uh, Good. <laughs> That's all I have to say about okay. it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> then next question, please. Another there was question. One, one in the back. Okay. So I just wanted to comment on the, on the type of information that we may be talking about within a forum. So it's one thing to think about um, political discourse and whether one's opinion um, at moveon.org or um, in uh, Greenwald's film site um, it is risk, bears risk or is risk free. It's another thing, for example, to think about health related information. And when you start with a discussion group that may have a fairly small audience and you move on to a larger social network where health issues are being discussed, and then you move on perhaps to a forum where experts are sharing their ideas or opinions or information about health. There's a real variety of risk there for the average person to get online and look for health information. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that, because that, that was what came to mind for me when Professor Dreyfus was talking about um, risk versus you know, an opinion versus factual information. The risk would be that you would take this factual information and act on it, and it might be false. Uh, I think that's certainly true, but I and I sort of, though I don't understand the details. I think that Wikipedia is trying to, for instance, make it a bit more and more likely that the information you get will be uh, evaluated and won't be false. There must be a millions of health websites which are just superstition of, of, of every sort, and then I guess that's where uh, where is he? Uh, I can't think of his name. The guy who was concerned about how to judge whether you're... Howard Reingold. Yeah, well, how, where Howard Reingold is rightly concerned. Somehow people have to learn to uh, minimize the risk of being taken in by things that are just... It sort of becomes a matter of trust. Who do you trust or what source of information do you trust? I guess, and that's, that's okay. I mean, if you can find a source of information that you trust, <laughs> then it's a source of information, and that's that's... Good. I guess we should bring in uh, what I get all these people's names. Uh, Mitch Kapoor's uh, view there that you're not going to get that you aren't claiming you are. I just want to make the distinction he made, which is so valuable. You're not going to get help about values things about how, you know, whether you should keep people alive of, of how long or if at all and so forth when they have terminal diseases. I mean, th those those are decisions that you can have philosophical discussions about. But then there are these factual things, like what's the best uh, way to avoid getting this kind of disease or a cure getting that kind of disease. That's where you want to have a reliable source and no ways of 
which for sources to trust. But there, there is no reliable source. I mean, that's what I think uh, Kapoor is right about. What did he say? Don't go online for enlightenment about the social issues of our time. Uh, and I think you could just broaden that, and he holds that broader burden. Don't go online to find out what values to have. That, that's, that's not the problem. But I mean, just once we sort that out, I, I think, you know, go online to find out whom you can trust for factual information. Wikipedia is the model of that. Uh, don't do the public sphere thing, which is go online to find out what you should be, uh, what values you should have, because that's not the kind of thing you can get by enlightenment, detached, rational discussion, and period. I mean, that, though, you could separate the public sphere mistake, uh, enlightenment mistake, from the very valuable, uh, there's a whole new source of, of wisdom, well, not wisdom, knowledge there. Don't expect wisdom. Yeah, okay. Um, for, to go on with your question, uh, what I'm thinking and what I'm reminded of is uh, two, two simple, two real life examples. A young man saved his little sister from a bear. And somebody, well, people asked in the news reporters, how did you know, you know what to do when you were confronted by a bear? And the young boy said, well, I learned how to do it in a game. A computer, online computer game. Uh, the second one, uh, it, it's somebody who's a, race, who's a driver in Grand Theft Auto or some car racing game who recently has been hired by a racing team to drive real cars and has been a winner uh, and has is, is, is actually transformed himself from a computer jockey into a real race car driver. So these are new ways in which the Internet is commingling with reality such that, you know, those risks that were uh, mythical, you know, unreal myths, uh, um, risks, are now being w uh, the same thing as real risks. And so this is, could be turning Kierkegaard's notion. Um, it's, it's, wait, this is hard for me to understand yet. What's, yeah. the, real, what's the real risk in, in when you can have a car accident and nobody gets hurt on the, on the, on, oh, on the so web? But then you transform that driver. into the real... An car actual racer. car driver. What? He, he transformed. He became a real car driver. I claim you can't. I mean, I've got to figure out how. He's saying he knows of an example where someone did do that. Yeah, and I'm saying I can't understand how they could do that. So, but maybe right. I'm just wrong. Yeah. But it seems to me that the point would be: how can you worry? Oh, well, I can imagine that, and it's interesting. We should check it out. Either. Uh, you can't become a good driver except when you've really got something at stake like having an accident in which you get hurt or your car gets hurt and you can't have that. It, a virtual accident and a virtual car crash is not something it would look like. You can feel really risking it, relieved when you, don't have, when you get, get through it right and uh, horrified when you get killed. I mean, that, I mean, either it's something real or it's virtual and it looks like it doesn't, you couldn't acquire the skill. But now comes what you're raising, which I just don't know. Suppose you were just so committed to getting the game right, to winning, where the risk was simply virtual winning and virtual losing. Would that be enough to really give you the skill? You tell me that it is, and now that's, that's important to know. Uh, that, but then you need commitment. Then you need really to be, so to speak, make the game your world which I bet that person did, right. and in so, if, if you really live in it like that, you might be able to develop the skill. I mean, I, somebody who does experiments and, and you know, checks out the empirical, I mean, yeah. already this is part of it, but now you want to sort of interview this person and understand what really happened and how far into the game you have to be, and to me, it's, it's still amazing that you could develop the skill without uh, a a taking any risks except a kind of uh, virtual risk? That's the question. Do you have to have it a real world risk to develop a skill or is a virtual risk enough? And you're telling me a virtual risk is enough and I'm saying, wow. I it seems to be. It. For some people, I think the virtual risk is enough and can generate that interest. I mean, otherwise, you know, the army wouldn't make video games to try and recruit people into the army. Like, they want they want people to imagine that those skills will sort of seamlessly lead into the other set of, of things. But you're right, it takes that individual being willing to jump into the world of the game and make it real. 
and not everybody does that, which thank God, or else we probably wouldn't have video games. Because and just to go on, the, the, even the more strange situation is now the people that are flying un unattended aerial vehicles right. who are yeah. were gaming people who are now flying real planes and either killing um, yeah. citizens or soldiers, and they're not sure which. Yeah. That's interesting, because they, 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 they have the risk of losing the plane, but that doesn't seem important, really. They don't have a risk. They're not, a, they're not at risk, and yet they can do this. And now that I think of it, uh, my brother and I were consultants in something which now it seems to me goes on your side, that is SimMeth, this whole thing with tanks on an actual territory. It was East Germany when we were involved in it. And uh, there are these people in the tanks and seeing on the screen the other tanks and, and, and shooting at them and so forth. And we wondered at the time, my brother's a professor at Berkeley too, and we write, we write stuff about skills. So we wondered at the time, can they get it just from that? And the answer seems to be yes, because they've got this whole developed uh, technology now for teaching people a lot about some learning tank stuff. Mm -hmm. My wiggle room to get out of this would be, but then again, it's empirical. We ought to check it. Maybe they only get competent this way. I could believe that. If they can get mastery of it, there are expertise at being tank commanders by playing SimNet. That I am really... I have to rethink things. Different. Yeah, okay. that would be something different. Competence that you can get, because that really is still a kind of rule followed. But when, uh, but, well, anyway, th there's a very important, interesting question there. I should ask Jack Thorpe, who's the developer of SimNet, what level of skill they think they get. I, I will ask him. Okay, well, we need to, to uh, conclude now, um, and we can carry on our discussion um, over lunch. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you.